Welcome to another episode of What's On Your Mind. In this episode, I've got David Perlin and Anthony Iser on the show, who are both senior trading mentors at the Institute of Trading and Portfolio Management. They've got fantastic track records, and I can't wait to start this conversation with them. But just before I do, I want to remind you guys watching that if you're enjoying the content that we're providing through this What's On Your Mind series, then your education doesn't need to stop there. You can head over to our website, itpm.com and see all the educational resources that we have to offer. So for example, we've got information on all our seminars and live events that we do around the world that are upcoming. Uh, we've got links to our premium online education courses that teach you how to build and manage your own portfolios. And we've also got mentoring program applications up there where you can apply to one of these mentoring programs with guys like David and Anthony who will help you practically implement all the theory you learn through the courses in a live trading environment. Then beyond that, we've also got the biggest event of the year for ITPM coming up in 2019. We've got the London Super Conference on the 15th of June. It's the only super conference we'll be doing this year, so tickets are selling out really quickly. So if you do plan on going, then grab one of those tickets fast. It's basically a full day of presentations with all the guys that you see on the What's On Your Mind series, the senior trading mentors, giving presentations on various trading topics. Now, back to the show then. Um, we're almost two months into 2019. Uh, there's been uh, pretty much a consistent rally in US markets, at least throughout that period, after a bumpy 2018. So, David, what's your take on where we are now and what lies ahead? Well, uh, hello, Chris. Hello, Anthony. Um, as you can see, I'm enjoying a snow day here in the East Coast, northeast of America. Um, and uh, as dysfunctional as our government is, uh, D.C. cannot function in any kind of snow. So uh, it's closed. Federal government's closed, et cetera. Um, happy to say the market's open and the Fed was able to release their minutes from their last meeting, um, which is timely and topical for what we're speaking about today. Um, V-shaped recovery, uh, Fed on pause, which was the gift to the market, ended the risk off scenario that ended the fourth quarter, um, which got way ahead of itself, quite frankly. Um, uh, it's always difficult to buy markets when they are straight down as they were in December. Um, but that was obviously the right move to the extent that people were able to do that. Um, I'm of the opinion with many of the mentors and Anton included that this has gone a little too far too fast. Um, that being said, I'm always respectful of uh, directional energy and that energy has been up uh, in US markets, broadly speaking, and climbing what we used to call on Wall Street, the wall of worry. So, so what does that mean? Well, if you, if you make a list of things that could be challenging to the market um, and therefore create some skepticism in the ability for the market to rally, um, then the market overcoming those concerns is climbing a wall of worry. The wall of worry includes Brexit. It includes the global slowdown. It includes the possibility of recession um, in 2019 or 20 in the US. Uh, it includes whether or not there will be a formidable US-China trade deal. Uh, it includes whether or not there will be another tariff regime applied to Europe, specifically in, in autos. Um, and all of these things are still there. They haven't disappeared from, from the concern bucket of the fourth quarter, uh, with the exception of the Fed being in a proactive tightening and QE reduction mode. So that tightening by the Fed has been removed, risk on is back, and here we are. Um, so that's my backdrop, trying to figure out when to maybe pivot to either market neutral or short a bit in general. And that risk on, David, is, uh, I mean, it's showing up in all asset classes, hasn't it? Not just the equities, which we tend to look at. Uh, I was having a look at uh, some of the credit returns and you know junk junk is up uh, 4.8 percent year to date emerging markets 4.1 bank loans three percent uh, high quality corporate uh, two and a half all the way down to long-term US government uh, up 0.8 so a real skew towards risky assets within uh, within credit markets as well uh, and and obviously we've seen it uh, in equity markets and there's an interesting chart that, uh, courtesy of uh, a guy called Kevin Smith, 
he put out basically uh, looking at stocks that are trading above their 50-day moving average. And he's put it out from the context that uh, we're in a bear market. Now, if, if we are um, in, in, in a long-term bear market, um, then he's highlighting that uh, we're at unprecedented levels in terms of uh, this rally that we're seeing at the moment. So it's, it's very common at these points in cycles, uh, towards the end of a 10-year economic cycle, strong, uh, strong stock market cycles as well, that we're going to see these sort of V-shaped recoveries and, and sort of down by the stairs as well. So it's really just a matter of trying to sort of work our way through some of these big macro issues, isn't it, David? Absolutely. Um, and they're not, like I said, they haven't disappeared. Um, but obviously the, the fear that whatever weakness was was being priced in um, and a hard landing specifically has been uh, has been removed. Um, you know, the, the, an extension of the of kind of your list of risk assets that have reacted. Uh, the opposite of risk assets would be kind of U.S. government paper. And we have not seen a dramatic shift in in the yields, uh, not no, not just in yields, broadly speaking, but the yield curve. Um, so that really isn't changing or informing us much right now. Um, and rates have, rates have uh, definitely subsided as a concern for the market. Yeah, and I guess one of the other sort of risk, uh, risk on, uh, or oh, sorry, risk off assets uh, that people tend to look at at, at at the end sort of late cycle is gold uh, and conversations with Jason uh, earlier in the year, he was starting to have a look uh, at some of the gold names because we've seen um, some sizable uh, acquisitions uh, in in the gold sector. And that's usually uh, reflective of a couple of things. Uh, obviously, the increasing cost of uh, mining gold, so it's cheaper to go and acquire assets uh, in the market. Uh, we saw a couple of big ones, um, uh, Barrick uh, in particular, uh, uh, made a big acquisition, uh, and so did Newmont uh, recently. And we've seen central bank buying of gold as well. Russia uh, has been buying gold, Hungary and Poland, countries that have geopolitical risks and economic risks. Um, and so perhaps they're looking to hedge uh, some of the potential currency risk if things uh, continue down the current path. So there seems to be a sort of a broad support for gold. Uh, but as Jason highlighted uh, in previous conversations, and I'll do again here now, gold stocks is probably the way to play it. If you, if you think the gold price is going to go up, whether it's because of industrial demand, central bank buying, or through uh, concerns about the global economy and a real risk-off environment, then you want to have a look at gold stocks because their beta is about 18 uh, so you get 80% extra kicker on the gold price by buying the leading gold names. But it's interesting that the market is still very underweight these. So those big concerns about the market uh, and underweight the gold price as well uh, haven't sort of flowed through into uh, these sort of risk assets. It's interesting. I've, I've always found that certain asset classes always get underreported on. Um, and we won't, we won't be hearing... Uh, and seeing gold bugs, if you will, being interviewed on CNBC till the till the gold price is up 28, 30 percent, and then they'll start, you know, putting it on the screen and, and finding people that specialize there. Um, interestingly, as an extension of that, I was speaking to Anton the other night, just comparing kind of tactical and strategic positioning for this market, um, and with Brexit, um, the impact for euro in general, um, and and the fairly obvious ongoing slowdown in Europe writ large, whether or not we we contemplate whether this uh, this union is having you know an existential moment, uh, being long gold in euro terms is a really interesting trade, and there's a uh, there's a futures contract at the CME that reflects that. So essentially, you're long gold in in, in short euro by definition. Uh, in that in that instrument, which is pretty interesting. Yeah, it certainly is. And uh, I, I've actually had a couple of uh, European-based mentees uh, uh, bringing that up on their own as well. So it, it's clearly something that uh, a lot of people are looking at. 
Yeah. So one of the other things at this point in time as well is is trying to filter out all the noise, David, uh, because you can find someone sitting there saying, you know, the market's primed for a massive rally, someone who's uh, concerned that things are going down, but it's it's always best to try and sort of refer back to the data as well and see what's going on. Uh, and the, the economic data, particularly in the US, has been uh, slowing a little bit, but certainly not flashing red recessions. Uh, but there was one bit of data that came out recently that that was pretty negative, which uh, it's not, it's a, it's a quarterly number from the World Trade Organization, a uh, composite of seven drivers of trade that they look at. Uh, its reading was at 96 and a half, um, and that's the lowest it's been since March 2010. March 2010 was sort of the end of when global trade through that GFC period um, had really sort of bottomed out and started to started to pick up a little bit. So that's a bit of a concern. Um, and maybe it's just showing that some of these trade tensions with uh, the US and China in particular are starting to bite um, because there was one indicator within that, uh, transmissions of, uh, of cargo through ports, it was a little bit stronger. And it just sort of feels like people were trying to get ahead of the next big round of, uh, of tariffs uh, and, and, and get their goods into the US in particular before that happened. Yeah, I believe that, that, that the whole tariff dance has, has skewed these numbers, unfortunately. Um, and quite frankly, the markets made this decision at least over the last few weeks that a deal was imminent or you know, certainly there's a delay. Um, as we approach early March, there, there, won't be a, there won't be a surcharge to uh, the current Chinese tariff deal that's been, that's been forewarned at least. Um, and those conversations continue. Um, as a betting man, I'm a little skeptical that a gigantic favorable deal will come to fruition. So I think that is another reason for my, you know, sounding a little bit cautious at this level. Yeah. And has there been anything on the stock level that you've looked at uh, of note in the last little while? It's sort of a bit hard with all the macro news floating around. Yeah, we've, we've been discussing a lot more um, pairs trading in general, um, given kind of the risk on risk, risk off switching um, and, and trying not to get caught off sides, if you will. Um, so. You know, one of the one of the shorts that we revisited after a um, a short covering rally on earnings was Snap, um, which you know I think anybody that that follows the company even remotely realizes they're kind of dead, um, and it's just going to be a you know a, an ebb to an ending, um, where you know Facebook and others continue to outflank their business, um, and they just don't have the management ability to kind of compete. Um, so, so that's something you have to be prepared in a bear market in a stock that's that's heavily shorted. Uh, that occasionally they can surprise on the upside for a quarter. Uh, but you know, generally speaking, I like to put those shorts back on. Um, I'm also looking at uh, small caps, which had a, a terrible fourth quarter and have had mm. a shape rally like everything else, but even more so. Um, again, I think if uh, if this mixed bag of economic indicators starts to slow down again, um, which we're having, again, we had retail sales the other day that was head scratching this uh, week, um, that some of these stocks are, are probably uh, ripe. And then to kind of really focus on whether or not the tariff deal plays out, we've had industrials rally dramatically, led by Boeing, some chemicals, engineering, energy, um, and all of those, if in fact this deal is not as robust as, as now currently baked in, would be uh, ripe for a little bit of a pullback. So that's kind of the way we're defining where uh, where some opportunity is on the short side. Yeah, it feels very much like uh, sort of revisiting some of the ideas that we've sort of done work on over the last six to twelve months as well, and presenting sort of new opportunities. Um, the home builders sentiment index came out and was uh, a little bit stronger than expected, which is the first time that sector's had um, sort of decent news um, at its sort of sector level. Um, so uh, a company that lots of the, the mentees uh, and mentors have been looking at, uh, T-Rex in the, in the US, which is a composite building materials company, which has been performing well since 
the latter part of last year, so into this, uh, in with this rally. So still looking at that, uh, it's, um, it does stand out well relative to the other names in the sector. So again, as you mentioned, David, looking at pairs trades rather than just outright, uh, outright positions. And then the curious one, which I think is probably more of a, a, a long-term investment trade rather than a shorter-term trading portfolio, uh, pairs trade. Still think Disney long and uh, and Netflix short uh, is going to be uh, a winning position, but I don't know even if we can put it on. You're going to have to wear some very big movements uh, upwards in Netflix um, during these rallies. And then I guess there's a potential that Netflix could get taken out. But longer term, uh, Disney's got the content, the cash flow and balance sheet uh, to really make some inroads into Netflix uh, market share. And, and uh, yeah, that's just a question of how you how you put that one on. And with volatility, uh, VIX back down to sort of very 10-month low levels, uh, maybe maybe you have a look at doing it via options. Um because then uh, that that risk uh, on the on the upside with Netflix gets taken out, and then the other one which I'm still very curious about but not brave enough to do anything about is is Tesla. Uh, their general counsel just quit after two months. They've had their CFO quit. If you go back and have a look at the yeah. people who have left over the last couple of years, it's the who's who of uh, any corporation, and there's enough. Uh, rumor and innuendo out there. If anyone wants to go and look at it, that there's been uh, questions about their their accounting. Uh, I'm not saying it's a fraud, but there's uh, there's a, certainly a lot of smoke. So we'll, so we'll see what. Yeah, we'll see what happens with that. But again, two months in your job at, as general counsel and you quit. Uh, that's that's quite concerning. Uh, but again, it's. Uh, it's one of the most heavily shorted names out there, uh, so it's an expensive, expensive trade to put on. Yeah, I've seen. I think I saw it even today. Uh, a list of senior management that have resigned in the last, call it, twelve months, and I think it's like yeah. 40, forty names or something dramatic. Um, never a good sign. Um, so, uh, and I and it's a segue to like the product, hate the stock, or at least concerned about the stock. And I would put Netflix in that category where, like, I love it. You know, we use it. Um, kids are watching it now on a snow day, but maybe don't want to be long at these prices. Uh, and Tesla, the same. I uh, love driving my car, but, you know, concerned about governance. We'll call it that. Um, the other thing, I, I think this is a good segue from those type of stocks, is um, what, we're, what we're about to what we're about to experience in U.S. markets is a plethora of great U.S. growth companies that have been private for decades um, by virtue of availability of private capital is unmatched in this in this economy um, in my history. So, um, you know, Google and Amazon went public, and Facebook went public at a much at a much younger point in their corporate life than Airbnb, Uber, Lyft, Pinterest, Palantir. Uh, Slack, um, to name kind of the, the, the front pack of, of Decacorns, Decacorns being companies privately valued at 10 billion plus. Um, so forget the term unicorn, we're talking about Decacorns. Um, so we have, a, we, have a, we have an intent for all of those companies I just mentioned to go public. Um, government shutdown closed that window for the first quarter. Now they're in a rush to, to get to the market. The market supportive uh, equities are up. They're always going to kind of thread the needle because if the market decides to have a five percent pullback, some of these things will be delayed. Um, but for the purposes of people watching, in addition to these interesting companies coming and what it re what the read through to risk on will be, is also how portfolio managers and hedge funds and in mutual funds make room for these new equities. So. If I'm going to buy Slack as a, as a portfolio manager, I might sell Team out of my inventory. If I'm going to buy Airbnb, I might sell Hilton or Marriott. And I think these, these turn into pretty good pairs trades, or at least a list of short names that could be displaced by these very large equity IPOs that are coming. 
And that's that's both presumably for discretionary managers, but also particularly the guys that follow the indices because they're going to become big parts of those indices and they right. don't have a choice but to buy them. Absolutely. Um, so these could be interesting, obviously, as, uh, as pri largely private retail investors getting access to IPOs is difficult um, in IPO allocations to narrow impossible. Uh, but it doesn't mean that you can't pay attention or put them on versus kind of incumbents as they uh, as they season a bit. Yes. What What about are either of you guys uh, seeing anything, any countries or um, sort of good long macro ideas outside the US? Is there anything that looks interesting? Because at the moment, a lot of the data that certainly I see, you know, points in the opposite direction. But I'm wondering if there's anything that might be missing. I'll hand it to my to my man in Southeast Asia. He gets to see that more closely than I do. Well, the the, the short answer for me is no. Um, it's a real concern when you look around the globe, and I think that's why uh, if you if you look at the Fed's comments, they're less concerned about what's going on in the U.S. and more concerned about the the uh, dramas, whether it's geopolitical or economic coming in from the rest of the world. Uh, Asia's not really firing on sort of any cylinders. China's trying to work out what to do and how to balance their growth uh, or lack of. Um, and I think, again, it's important to reiterate that it is a closed economy and it's a central government and they don't want 400 million people marching into to, to Beijing saying, where's our ticket in this economic growth? So they'll handle it in a very different way from a, an open market economy. And we, we don't know what that is at, at the moment, and I don't think they know. Um, but I suspect they'll keep throwing money at it. Um, so maybe there's something that comes through there. Europe broadly looks pretty terrible, but there's going to be opportunities. But at the moment, they don't seem particularly clear. So I think, you know, that as you mentioned at the start, David, there's that wall of worry. Um, most of the, the sort of big macro levers probably are pointing towards uh, negative outcomes in the, the medium to longer term. It's just a question of when, sort of when that happens. Um, so the hard part is trying to find uh, trying to find things on the the long side at the moment. So it's really a function for me of just sort of reducing risk in terms of the the types of names, uh, and, and I guess symbolic of uh, how sort of tricky it is on the long side at the moment, you look at Walmart's result, which was uh, really strong, yeah. yet they couldn't hold on to their, to their gains. The stock rallied hard, and it's, uh, you sort of felt like this was a, an opportunity, even though it's not a growth stock, but a, a, a result that should have pleased a lot of people who particularly people have been skeptical and saying, well, Amazon's going to destroy them eventually. And this result certainly indicates that the companies can coexist, yet it couldn't hold their gains. So uh, I'm going to be sort of scouring the markets for some, some decent uh, buy ideas, but that's the hard part at the moment, Chris. Sure. And um, David, do you have a couple of thoughts on the sort of political situation, a bit of an update on, in the US? Sure, sure. Um, it's kind of, you know, 2020 campaign is off and running. Uh, it's seemingly, we're always in campaign mode. We're in two modes in the United States. We're in budget argument mode and campaign mode, and they seem to be always on. Um, these things used to be a little bit more seasonal, but now, uh, you know, obviously everybody's trying to uh, throw their hat in the ring on the Democratic side for presidential politics. Could be 20 plus people. Uh, by the end of uh, this period of, of raising your hand and declaring. Um, and interestingly, as highlighted by Bernie Sanders' uh, campaign announcement, that he's taking credit for the, the dialogue seemingly when he ran against Hillary for the Democratic uh, primaries four years ago, um, was he was so progressive and out of touch. And here we are four years later, and all his, all his commentary is basically a defined democratic plank, no matter who's running, within reason, um, from you know a higher minimum wage, free college, uh, healthcare for all, you know all these subjects. Um, now we can see the flip side, which is you know Trump's probably going to be unopposed, 
um, from the Republican side, um, and rightly so. And he's already labeling that movement as socialism. So, you know, it's a perfect hat, you know, where you can have um, capitalism versus socialism and capitalism always wins. Um, and you'll have uh, socialist sounding Democrats not being not wanting to be defined as such, but they won't have a choice. Um, and maybe a little bit more centrist conversation as as the as the actual candidate comes out of the primary season. So I think this is fun. Um, you'll see. Hopefully, you can uh, share the the um, the Economist cover with the uh, social socialism the U.S. version covered. Um, there's a U.S. debt ceiling uh, argument that will hit our airwaves shortly, um, and it'll sound a lot like uh, the shutdown conversation over the last two months. Um, and then the current deal expires shortly, so there'll be yet another budget negotiation. Um, but it seems to me that the wall has now moved into kind of a um, a uh, White House in the courts suing the White House for the emergency uh, movement. Uh, so it's fun. It's, it's sport. Uh, we'll all watch and, uh, and be entertained, and this will get some clarity as we go. Do you see any of that, uh, any of that stuff, kind of filter into into the markets, or is it too noisy or too uncertain to do so? I think, I think it's uh, noisy and it's difficult to handicap and model. I think it's a little bit early, um, but you know, as we see a couple of things happen, um, anything around a big healthcare shift, maybe there's a, there, maybe there's a play in both hospitals and insurance com- stocks. Um, as we see um, minimum wage words, that obviously affects restaurants and uh, and the WalMarts of the world um, that hire a lot of per hour uh, employees. So those are the kind of things I'll look for to see if they're getting more traction and more probability. Um, and also, obviously, if if in fact this campaign ends up being as close as it currently looks like it could be. All right. Well, uh, it's been a brilliant conversation with you guys on the show, as always. Uh, Unfortunately, I think we're going to have to end the episode there. But just before I do close the show, I want to remind you guys watching to head over to our website, itpm.com, where we've got lots of different educational resources up there for you guys. So particularly, um, we've got information on our upcoming live seminars that we do around the world. I know we've got a few coming up in North America, I think in Los Angeles, Florida, and also Toronto. Um, I think, David, you're doing at least one of those. Yeah. Um, we've also got, as I said at the beginning of the um, of the video, we've got our London Super Conference on the 15th of June. Tickets are selling out really fast for that because it's the only Super Conference that we're going to be doing this year. So do try and get a ticket to that as soon as possible. Um, also on the website, we've got bite-sized videos. We've got our online courses that teach you how to build and manage your own portfolios. And like I said at the beginning, our mentoring programs with guys like David and Anthony here who will help you practically implement all that knowledge that you've gained in the courses in your own live trading account. So uh, with that being said, that's all from us. And I hope you guys enjoyed the show and make sure you join us next time for another episode of What's On Your Mind.